This gentleman who is coming to speak to us today is really a godly man. Uh, I watch his life. Uh, I see a humble man. When I see him in the city and the role that he has in a group of people, he's not someone who demands attention, but he's a man who is given attention and respected. And when I think about people that I watch and look at, I see a, I see a godly man. I see a man that I want to look up to. And I want to model some character that I see in his life in the public. Bishop Carl Scott is born and raised in York, Pennsylvania. He's married 62 years. He's pastor, founded Bible Tabernacle Church, attended Lancaster Bible College, Hampton University. Uh, he told me not to read all this, but I'm trying to give you a picture of a man that the community loves. And, uh, but he is a member of the Black Ministers Association. He serves as senior advisor, chairman of the Civil Service Commissioners for the York Area Regional Police Department, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Governor's Award for Crime Prevention, Liberty Bell Award presented by the York County Bar Association, Community Service Award from Stepping Stones, uh, Eugene Blom Ecumenical Award, Bronze Good Citizenship Award from the Sons of the American Revolution, the 2001 Human Services Award from the Black Ministers Association, 2017 Ray Crenshaw Neighborhood Award, honorary doctorate degree from St. Thomas Christian University in Jacksonville, Florida. And above all that, a godly man and one that's well respected. So Bishop Carl Scott, if you would come and bring the word of God. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Amen. We are so glad to be here with you this morning. Happy to share in this service this morning. We honor Pastor Bob. Thank you for the invitation to be here. And then we enjoy the Temple of Grace ministry as they came this morning. I thank God for my wife, who also shares with us today, Lady Diane. Amen. And uh, my accompanying person is a pastor, or not pastor, but uh, I, I want to make him a pastor, Henry Wagstaff. He is my armor bearer this morning, and I thank God for him. I uh, also noticed uh, Pastor uh, Bishop Evan's wife is here also this morning, and we want to honor her. And I would think, I would think that uh, Pastor Bob's wife is someplace uh, around here, and so we want to honor her. It, it's important for us to honor our wives and appreciate them. Uh, all husbands don't. I, I heard a story the other day about a man who was noticing that his wife was very distant and uh, she just didn't seem to be involved and uh, he just didn't know what was wrong with her and he finally decided I'm going to take her to the doctor and see if we can find out what's wrong with her. So he took her to the doctor and he said, Doc, I need you to examine my wife. There's something wrong with her. She just seems to be down all the time and sort of depressed and I just, I just don't know what's wrong with her. And uh, the doctor said, well, let me examine her. He took her back into uh, his examination room, and they were there for about 30 minutes. And the doctor came out, and he said to the husband, he said, I know exactly what's wrong with your wife. He said, the, the husband said, well, tell, show me what's wrong with her. He said, no, I want to tell you. The doctor said, I want to tell you. The, the husband said, no, I want you to show me. And so the doctor grabbed his wife, put his arms around her, ran his hands through her hair, kissed her on her lips, and said to the husband, that's what's wrong with your wife. She needs that about three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The husband said, well, Doc, I can bring her in Wednesday and Friday, but... <laughs> he 
Praise the Lord. <laughs> Again, we just are so happy to be here and uh, to share with you on uh, this morning. Well, I probably have a different style of preaching than, than what you're used to, but I'm accustomed to somebody saying amen every now and then. Amen. I, I just want to know, sometimes the lights are blinding and I can't see you out there, but I just need to hear you say amen. Amen? amen. I want you to, uh, if you have your Bibles, open them with me to the book of Micah, chapter 4. Micah, chapter 4. I'm going to read for you the first five verses from which our message will be based this morning. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. Incidentally, I'm reading the NIV, the New Living Translation. Verse two, people from many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house, of Jacob's God. There we will, he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his path. There he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his path. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out from Jerusalem. The Lord will mediate between people and will settle disputes between strong nations far away. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will no longer fight against nations nor train for war anymore. Verse 4, everyone will live in peace and prosperity, enjoying their own grapevines and fig trees, for there will be nothing to fear. The Lord of heaven's army has made this promise. Though the nations around us follow their idols, we will follow the Lord our God forever. The word of the Lord is already blessed. I want to use for the time we share together this morning this first and fourth verse as our foundation. First verse says, in the the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills and people from all over will come uh, and stream there to worship. And verse 4 says, everyone will live in peace and prosperity, enjoying their own grapevines and fig trees, for there will be nothing to fear. The Lord of heaven's armies has made this promise. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day for this opportunity to preach your word to this waiting congregation. We pray in the name of Jesus that you would shower us with your anointing, that you would use us to your glory and to your honor, that your word would go forth with power, and you will be praised, you will be honored. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, on our journey through the Bible, we come to this book of Micah. Some of you may be familiar with this little book, and some of you may be wondering why at a time like this would we focus on a minor prophet like Micah. Well, allow me to give you a little background 
about Micah. You may well keep your Bibles available as we go through this message today. Micah is a very short section of the Old Testament. Uh, only seven chapters lodged between Jonah and Nahum. It was written about 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. And the name Micah means who is like Yahweh or who is like our God. Micah chapter 1 and verse 7 tells us that the book of Micah was written at a time when people throughout the earth were worshiping a variety of man-made and handmade gods. Micah chapter 2 and verse 1 tells us that God was angry that men and women were plotting evil. Chapter 2 and verse 2 says that God was angry that men and women were jealous of their neighbors and angry that people were being cheated out of their homes and their inheritance. Micah chapter 3 and verse 1 says that the religious leaders and politicians or political leaders were not lovers of justice. Chapter 3 and verse 5 says that religious and spiritual leaders were open to bribes. I'm in the Word. It's in the Bible. And the uh, they were quick to prepare to wage war. And in chapter 3 and verse 11, they even thought that what they were doing was pleasing to God. To me, that sounds very familiar. It almost paints a picture of where we are today. Micah looked out upon a nation which had lost sight of its mission to be a blessing to the rest of the world. Micah looked out upon a nation which had misused God's name and he declared that God was displeased with them and that God was going to bring judgment upon such activity. I believe that God is looking at us like that right now. And an amen goes right there. Some of Micah's words may be more familiar to you than you realize, especially to some of the older generation. Martin Luther King Jr. in his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech on December the 10th, 1964, quoted from our text in the book of Micah in his speech, Micah chapter four and verse four, he said, Martin Luther King said, that one day every man will sit under his own grapevine, under his own fig tree, and no one would make him afraid. In January of 1977, President Carter was inaugurated and in his inauguration speech he Quoted from Micah chapter 6, he said, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly before your God? 1959, the Soviet Union presented a bronze statue to the United Nations, nine feet tall, and that bronze sculpture of a man beating a sword into a plowshare, and on the base of that sculpture were the words from Micah chapter 4 and verse 3, we shall beat our swords into plowshares. With our nation in turmoil, and many are losing hope, I thought it would be good if we would spend some time today looking at this little book of Micah and see if we can't develop a new vision of hope. In the midst of the trouble all around us and people becoming discouraged, I believe that what we need is hope. I remember growing up hearing old folks sing that 
old song, they called it a Negro spiritual, and it said, I'm so glad trouble don't last always. I'm so glad trouble don't last always. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? And so I believe this trouble will not last always. This too shall pass. And what we need to do is call on the name of Jesus. For I believe that what we need today more than anything else is we need a new vision of hope. And that's what I want to preach about this morning. A new vision of hope. So for a few moments today, I want you to go with me and draw your attention to this little book in the Old Testament. We don't know a whole lot about Micah. The first verse says that he he was a prophet during the years of several kings, Jothan and Ahaz and Hezekiah. About 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Now a prophet is one who tells people how it is between them and God. Unfortunately, we hear the word of God through men and women that God has ordained to preach his word, but we don't always listen. The political scene in that day was not pretty. Off to the north and to the east, a country named Assyria was gathering steam, crushing every nation in its path. Assyria had already advanced to the, to the border of the northern part of Israel and was soon to take over and overrun that part of the country as well. And that's when Micah comes on the scene with a message from the Lord. Now, when something bad happens, as humans, there are two things we want to know. Why it happened and how long will it last? In other words, we, we want an explanation and we want a word of hope. Sometimes in our modern society, we are left with our own conclusions and that's always bad. Uh, and the real answers sometimes are hard to find and sometimes we are left with a sense of hopelessness. But in this case, Micah provides us with a word of hope. Let's begin with chapter 1 and verse 3. I told you to keep your Bibles out. Micah says, look, the Lord is coming. Micah's words lets us know that God has not forgotten us. Whether they are saved or unsaved, God is coming. Sometimes it may seem like God is some long distance off, that he's shut up somewhere in heaven, that he he doesn't care a stitch about you or what you're going through. But be assured today, he has not forgotten you. The Lord is coming. Because Micah said that he cares about you and he cares about what you're facing. Over and over for the last several months, we have heard terms like pandemic, COVID-19, coronavirus, unemployment, murder by cop, racism, demonstrations, riots, and just a general unrest. People of this world, especially those whose skin happens to be black or brown, have felt like God has forgotten us. The good news is that God has not forgotten you. The Old Testament prophet by the name of Micah reminds us that God stepped out of heaven to meet us where we are. He says the Lord is coming. But that's not, that's not the only part of the story. If we read on in chapter one, we see why God was so concerned 
about his people. The book says that they had not been living up to the standards that he had established. They were not walking in his ways. God has so carefully given us his word, his commandments, and through his disciples and the prophets of old has given us a standard by which we are to live. We have ignored his word. We have disobeyed his commandments and literally established a standard of our own. Micah was telling these people that they had crossed the line with God. They had not been walking in God's ways. And that's why God was allowing this big country of Assyria to overtake them. Chapter 1 and verse 5 says that they had sinned. Well, what had they done? Verse 7 in the same chapter tells us that they had created images and idols. And had become, that had become their object of worship. Remember the first of the Ten Commandments? You shall have no other gods before me. Number two says you shall not make for yourself any idols or bow down to them. They had violated the first two commandments. Their primary allegiance, are you listening? Their primary allegiance was no longer to the God they promised to serve. And Micah told them that God was displeased with them. Well, we may ask, what does their sin have to do with us? After all, we don't worship idols or images. Really? If Micah were here today, he might well ask us, just what do you worship? Is your attention focused on God and his son Jesus Christ who came and sacrificed his life for our sins? Or is your attention focused on what you might gain for yourself? Is our minds focused on how we can please God or how we can please ourselves? As modern day believers, we too are not free from images and idols that take uh, the place of God. Today, Micah might have some harsh words for us as well. Idolatry was not the only sin, however, that Micah preached against. In chapter 2, he preached judgment against crooked politicians. It's in the Bible, y'all. I'm not making this up. He preached judgment against crooked politicians, dishonest landlords, and even religious leaders. Listen to what he says in chapter 2 and verse 1. What sorrow awaits you who lie awake at night thinking of tweets, I mean plants. You rise up at dawn and hurry to carry them out simply because you have the power to do it. It's in the book. Unfortunately, they didn't miss it. Disobedience to God had taken second place and these people were fast losing their opportunities to be called the people of God. We may not like it when God's word points out our sin, but when our sins are revealed to us, Bishop, it's actually a gift from God. It's like pain in our bodies is actually a gift because pain lets us know something's wrong and that we need to do something about it. The murder of George Floyd in the streets of Minneapolis 
has reignited the flame of pain that has existed in this nation for over 400 years. And it once again reminds us that something's wrong in our nation. Something's wrong not only in the United States of America, but throughout the world. And not only in Minneapolis and New York and Los Angeles, but all over the nation, we are experiencing pain. Pain that lets us know something's wrong. And we should consider the knowledge of that a gift from God and do something about it. We are to confess our sins and repent. And another amen goes right there. Amen. We can make a difference. Let me say that again. We can make a difference. Jesus wants us to just simply respect each other. No matter how different we are, no matter what the color of our skin may be, Jesus wants us to work together in doing his work. Jesus wants us to love each other. And he told us to even love our enemies. What would happen if everyone lived and walked the way Jesus taught us? What would happen if everyone living would walk in God's way? We all know that the world is in a mess. It's been a mess for a long time. And just when we thought it couldn't get any worse, it did. Neighbors can't trust each other. We see powerful people taking advantage of the weak. Politicians that are more concerned about themselves than others. Many people resort to violence to solve their problems. Recent news reports have been downright discouraging. It's going to take a miracle. And only God can fix our situation. If we don't turn to God, where else? Can we go for hope? Well, you might think, what is a minor prophet like Micah saying to us today? Does any of this really apply to how we are behaving right now? Well, I just believe it does. Lots of people are concerned, frightened, and worried about the state of our nation. We, we, we hear mothers voicing their fears for their children as they grow up and walk the streets of their communities or drive their cars. Where is the next terrorism going to strike? When will another black man be killed in the street by a white police officer? When will it end? How many more lives are going to be cut short? Bible gives us hope. The coming of Jesus into the world gives us a real hope for now, for the future, and for eternity. Micah gets to the topic in chapter 4. His answer spells out a new vision of hope. Here it is. When people hear God's word and give up their idolatry, their hatred, their racism, and start living the way God has designed us to live, living the way Jesus taught us to live, a whole new world will unfold. Listen, God's commandments first came from Mount Sinai in the Ten Commandments. In this new vision, the Bible says that God's word will go out 
for all nations, not just the Jews, for all nations. This word will not just be knowledge for our heads, but instruction for our hearts so that the people will know how to live. What will it look like? What will it be like? Three things and I'm done. I see I got 12 minutes. First, Micah says in chapter 4 and verse 1, listen, people will stream to the Lord's house. <laughs> uh, I was on a, a Zoom call about three weeks ago. I've been Zoomed out here lately. I, I was on a Zoom call with over 275 bishops from all over the country. And the consensus from some of those bishops was that, was that some of the people have become so content with this virtual church that they, that they can just sit at home in their pajamas with a cup of coffee and watch church on their cell phones, their iPads, their computer, or their television. That they, they, some of these bishops believe that they have become so content with that that they're not going to come back to church. But you are a living witness that that's not true. The prophet Micah also disagreed with them. He said that people will stream to the Lord's house. Not just those that have been accustomed to coming, but many people, he said, from many nations. They will want to hear what thus saith the Lord. And the more come, that comes, the more that hears God's word, the more that want to come. Obedience will have a snowball's effect. Other people will take note of our obedience to God and will want to be a part of it as well. Obedience to God is, is a rewarding way to live. Micah says that those who see it will want to learn how to walk in God's path of obedience. No one will force them. They will do it willingly. In, in the mail, we, we get a notice from the bank or other institutions uh, that says that they are protecting our privacy so that people don't steal our identity. Y'all ever get any of those? Anybody ever get any of those? But that cannot be the case for Christians. <laughs> Your identity as a Christian must not be a private matter. It may be a personal matter, but it cannot be a private matter. Other people must know about the Lord Jesus Christ. There's another song that we used to sing way back in the day that says, when Jesus came into my heart, I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I just couldn't keep it to myself. What the Lord has done for me. The way we love each other, the way we treat each other, the way we live our lives before each other will send a clear message that we love the Lord Jesus Christ and desire to walk in his way. Because other people are watching how you live. Christianity cannot be a private matter. Who's watching you? Who, who's watching the way you follow Jesus? What, what are they seeing? What are they learning? Your faithfulness serves as an example to others. Remember Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. Not, not before him, before men. That they might see your good works and then glorify, not you, but your father, which is in heaven. And if you want to be a part of that stream of people 
who are walking God's way, just repent right now where you are. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. The Bible says you shall be saved. So the first thing Micah says is that people will stream to the Lord's house. The second thing he says is that in this new vision of hope, there will be peace. Humans will no longer exercise power over each other. God will be the judge. He will settle the differences. Psalms 49 says that he makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. And since wars will be obsolete, the instruments of war and violence can be converted into tools of agriculture and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. So people will have food and productive work. In God's society, nations will be infected with love for each other. Armies will develop amnesia and forget how to fight. So not only will people stream to the Lord's house and not only will there be peace, but the third thing I want to share with you and I'll be through five minutes. People will experience joy and security right where they live. They won't need to be afraid of each other and their needs will be supplied. Chapter 4 and verse 4. I love this verse. Everyone will live in peace and prosperity, enjoying their own grapevines and fig trees, for there will be nothing to fear. The Lord of heaven's armies has made this promise. Many people are acting on that vision already. How is this new vision of hope possible, you ask? In Micah chapter, Micah's day, 700 years before Jesus was born, people were given, listen, people were given a vision of God's gift of the Prince of Peace. Over the years, that vision was spelled out little by little in prophecies until one day the angel of the Lord announced that Jesus the Christ was born in a little town called Bethlehem. That Jesus would come and heal the sick. That Jesus would come and open blind eyes. That Jesus would make the lame to walk, the dumb to talk, and raise even the dead. That Jesus would teach us how to walk in God's way. That Jesus would die on a cross so that you and I could receive him as our personal savior. The book of Micah allows us to peep into God's future plans, to settle disputes, his future plans, and a future time when many people from many nations will stream back to the church to worship the true and the living God. Let's live with hope. Hope in our hearts. Hope in our lives. Hope in the life of our nation. And hope that we will be, that others rather will be attracted to us. And that they will come searching for this true meaning of hope. And be able to see it in the examples that we that call ourselves Christians are living. Perhaps you're listening right now and saying, how can I experience that love? How can I experience that forgiveness? How can I experience that acceptance, that hope? Well, the answer is found only in Jesus the Christ, the only begotten Son of God who says to you, that if you will confess your sins, he said, if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness. So just where you are, if that's your desire today to repent and to give your heart to Christ, maybe somebody here would even want to make their way down to the altar and pray this prayer with me. If you're here today and you have not confessed your sins and accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, you don't have this hope that I'm talking about. But if you want to do that today, just say with a sincere heart, Lord, I am a sinner. Sin, sin separates me from you. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and save me. If you've prayed that prayer with a sincere heart, repented of your sins, and have a mind to follow Jesus, you are now a part of the family of God, the body of Christ. And you can sing with me like the hymnologists of old. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. There is no other solid rock on Christ. Solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. A new vision of hope. God bless you.